how many of you have quiet time every day? You know, when you have quiet time every day, God can give you thoughts that you didn't have before. And also during the day, he wants to give you special things. And what I'm going to share today is from some of the things that have come from my quiet time and also that have come from other people's experience, but mostly from my Bible. We have a little book that we carry in our bag when we go knocking on doors. That's what we do. And it's our second most chosen book called The Ministry of Healing. And if you have this book, it comes in different editions. There are different pagings. But there's a quote, it's a one-liner sentence that's so good. It's on the very last page, the very last paragraph. So it doesn't matter which copy you have. You can find this quote. It's in the very last paragraph of the book. And it says, Whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with the help of God, rise above them. Whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with the help of God, rise above them. This one line has helped me so much again and again in my life because whatever the mistakes, whatever the failures of the past, I can, with the help of God, rise above them. And what a lot of hope and encouragement that brings. And I like all the examples God gives us in his word, just how he does this for us. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, we have an explanation. I'm going to use the Bible a lot, so if you'll have your Bible handy, I'd like to encourage you to open it. This first one is in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. It tells us why we have so many stories in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. And it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the reason these are all written down is for us at the end of the world. So I thought, we could look in our Bible today and see some of the people that made some really bad mistakes. You could say they really messed up big time. You ever felt like you did that? Go to Genesis, right at the beginning of your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in a pew right in front of you on one of those hymnal racks. Genesis 25. Now, this is a a well-known character. You've probably heard of him. His name was Jacob. And it is one of the most complete biographies the Bible gives us, the story of Jacob. And I'm going to start in chapter 25, and we're going to start at verse 21. This is after after, uh, Isaac and Rebekah were married. And it says, Isaac, verse 21, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, through further study, you figure out they'd been married for 20 years, so this is why they were very concerned. 20 years. And finally, here she is. She's going to have children. And we'll go on for a few verses. Verse 22. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Apparently, she was having a lot of activity down here. And the Lord said unto her, verse 23, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. 
and the elder shall serve the younger. And where de- when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Is anyone here a twin? Anybody here a twin? My mother had some twins, but my mother was not a twin. But these boys were not identical twins, as you'll soon find out. Verse 25, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And after that, his brother came out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Verse 27, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, you see here, and the family's getting set up for some conflict. Because Isaac has his favorite son, Rebecca has her favorite son. And it says that uh, they each loved their favorite son. So Esau was firstborn, and that meant he would be heir to a double portion of his father's property. And being Isaac's firstborn, the birthright also made him an inheritor of all the blessings promised by God to Abraham. But you know, Esau didn't really care about it. He didn't care about the birthright. He was more interested in being known as a great hunter than in becoming head of the camp and the priest of the family. Jacob, on the other hand, craved the birthright. Jacob was born just a few minutes after Esau, but that made him younger. But he, he didn't care so much for the riches it would bring as for the promises of God that he could be the spiritual leader of the home. He just had the birthright. You know, he, he wanted it so much, he thought about it day and night. How can I get the birthright? Just a few minutes. How can I get the birthright? Oh, I really would like to have the birthright. He thought about it and thought about it. What could I do to get Esau to give me the birthright? And one day, he saw his chance. If you look at verse 29, it tells the story. It says, Esau, I mean, that Jacob sawed pottage. That means he cooked. He was with his fire over over there in the camp, and he had his pot over the fire, and he was making soup, pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. He was faint with hunger. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Esau. Oh, Jacob had his chance. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do me? Verse 33, and Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So they traded. Esau got a quick meal, and Jacob got some dirty dishes. And a promise for the birthright that he was never quite sure Esau would honor his promise. So he got dirty dishes and guilt and stress. In chapter 27, we have what happened a few years later. Pardon. Isaac, getting to be an old man, he tells Esau to go hunting. 
Make him a savory meal so that he can bless him before he dies. Isaac's an old man now. He's blind. But Rebecca overhears what Isaac says. And she hurries to make sure her favorite son, Jacob, is the one to get this blessing. <clears throat> if you do a little math, you find that if Isaac was 60 when the boys were born, and the boys are approaching 40 now, Isaac's close to 100 years old. <clears throat> she sends Jacob out to get two kids from the flock so she can make the meal. She can send Jacob in to intercept that blessing. He objects, not because he's blind, but he's afraid he might be caught. Esau's a hairy man, he says, but I'm a smooth man. What if my father feels me and guesses who I really am? Then he'll give me a curse instead of a blessing. But Rebecca insists, just never mind, just do as I say. I'll fix it. So Jacob goes and he gets the goats. She makes the meal. <clears throat> she puts the hairy goat skins on the back of Jacob's hands and on the back of his neck. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> she dresses him in Esau's best clothes and sends him in to Isaac. Not because Isaac can see the clothes, but because he can smell them. You can imagine the scene. She's handing in the soup. All right, before your brother gets back. <coughs> what a lot of stress. <coughs> I can't get away from this mic, sorry. But he goes ahead, and he deceives his father. He claims to be his brother. And he receives the coveted blessing. And when his father asks, are you really my very son, Esau? I am. He leaves his father's presence. And he rushes to get out of his brother's clothes as fast as he can. Again. He gets the dirty dishes and a lot of guilt for his crime. But the Bible tells how close he came to getting caught in the act. Genesis 27, <clears throat> verse 30. It says, And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob. And Jacob was scarce, yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting, and he also made savory meat and brought it unto his father, and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that my, thy soul may bless me. What a shock he's in for, because Isaac says to him in verse 32, Who art thou? And he said, I'm thy son, the firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly. And he said, who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. Thirty-five, his father says, Thy brother came with subtlety and has taken away your blessing. And Esau replies in 36, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. And then he cries, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? What a scene. And Isaac did give Esau another blessing 
but it wasn't the same, and he knew it. So he hated his brother Jacob. And he consoled himself, saying, after my father dies, then I'll kill him. Of course, this kind of hatred can, you can't keep to yourself. And pretty soon the camp was whispering, and the word got back to Rebecca. She made arrangements for Jacob to flee to her brother Laban's house, 500 miles away. So Jacob had cheated his brother, he had lied to his father, and he had to flee for his life. As he trudged along, he thought of the terrible mess he had made of his life. He had lost his home, he had alienated his brother, dishonored his father, and he would never see his mother again. His favorite parent. If anyone ever felt like a low-down criminal, it was Jacob. He was crushed with discouragement. How could God ever forgive him for his actions? How could he ever receive the promises he had desired so much? As he threw himself on the cold ground and put his head on a stone for a pillow, I'm sure he cried himself to sleep in utter grief and exhaustion. But had God forgotten Jacob? No. God had not forgotten Jacob. In verse 12, it tells what happens next. He dreamed. And behold, a ladder set upon the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I've done that which I've spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid. And he said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob worshipped the Lord there, and he vowed, to live for him. God kept his promises to Jacob. He carried him through a long and challenging life and brought him at last to a peaceful end. And that later ladder was not given just for Jacob. It is given to us all. Jesus told about this ladder in John 151 when he was talking to Nathaniel. The ladder is himself. And it says in John 1, 51, He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now let's just look at another example. Aaron. This is also a person who is fairly well known in the Bible. And this is found in Exodus 32. Aaron was the brother of Moses, the Moses that read, wrote the first part of the Bible. Aaron was his right-hand helper. He had been with Moses and the children of Israel through all the plagues of Egypt. He had marched out with them in the great exodus. He had walked through the Red Sea with, with them when God delivered them from their enemies. Aaron was with them at the foot of Mount Sinai when God spoke the Ten Commandments amid lightning and thunder. When God called Moses to come up into the mount, Aaron was left in charge of all the people. But then what happens? Here in chapter 32, we find out some things. While Moses is delayed in the mount, Aaron yields to the people. And it says that he made them a golden calf. And he led them into feasting and false worship. They brought him all their earrings 
and he received it. And then in verse 4, it says that he actually fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf. And they said, Peace be thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. God is so disappointed in them. He's ready to consume them and start over. But Moses pleads and intercedes for Aaron and for the people. The golden calf is burned, melted, pounded, and ground into dust. What a lot of suffering and repentance, sacrifices and cleansing the whole camp had to go through to get beyond this one mistake of Aaron. You can read the whole complicated story in chapters 32 and 33. It's very complex. But God accepted their repentance and humiliation. He still entrusted to them the building of the sanctuary, and he chose Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. God still had something important for Aaron to do. He saw in Aaron someone who would love and serve the people. Instead of leaving him with a little pile of gold dust and shame, he forgave him and raised him up to serve as his high priest to represent Christ for nearly 40 years. He lifted him above the mistakes and failures of his past and gave him a wonderful present and future. And our last example is from one of the stories of a king that's not very well known. This story is one of the last kings of Judah, and it happened years later. After God's people had been in Canaan for hundreds of years, during those years, they wandered away from God many times. They wanted to be like other nations, and you can find these stories in 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25. That's where we're going next, 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25. During those years, they wandered away from God many times. They wanted to be like other nations. They begged for a king. God let them have their way, but what a lot of sorrow came from most of their kings. A few were good kings like David and Hezekiah and Josiah, but most were bad kings who led them farther and farther away from God. Finally, the Lord warned them through his prophets that they would be carried away captive to Babylon. Over and over, they were called to repent, but they refused. You can read these stories in the last part of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. So we're going to pick up this story in 2 Kings 24, verse 8. This king's name was Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was 18 years old. 2 Kings 24, 8. He was 18 when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem for just three months. Just three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, and the daughter, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And verse 9 says what he did in those three months. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. That's what kind of a young man he was. He decided to go the evil route, just like his father. And his fling at being a wicked king ends in captivity as a result. And here's the story, starting at verse 10 and going on. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. That's the eighth year of king Babylon, the king of Babylon's reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all, all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, 
and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon. And the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land, those he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all that were, were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah his father's brother king, in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So, Jehoiachin, the bad king, he's 18, he reigns three months. He's carried away into captivity and put in prison. Someone else is made king, and it sounds like you'll never hear about him again. But this story has an amazing ending. If you turn the page over to the end, the very end of chapter 25, it picks up in verse 27 and tells about what happened to this king that went into captivity. Starting at verse 27. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month and on the twenty-seventh day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up his head, the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him. And he set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon. And he changed his prison garments. And he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day, all the days of his life. Just think of it. Jehoiachin, a bad teenage king, reigned three months, was carried away to Babylon. He was in captivity 37 years. He had a long, long time to think about his actions, to repent, to be harassed by doubt or discouragement. He probably figured nothing would ever change and that he would die in prison. Then he was lifted up, and he ate at the king's table the rest of his life. Why does God let us see the rest of the story? The answer is in Romans, Romans 15. It's a wonderful answer. Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, and that we through comfort, through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That we might have hope. And in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, gives us another clue. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed, with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of, of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, it said that Jehoiachin would receive a certain amount continually for the rest of his life. And it says in Hebrews 25, about Jesus. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God has hope for you. No matter what bad decisions you have made, no matter what consequences you have suffered, no matter how long you may have been in a prison, of doubt, discouragement, or circumstances. He has not forgotten you. The God who worked in the beh their behalf is still working, and he's still waiting in our behalf. Whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with the help of God, rise above them. He can take your dirty dishes and guilt 
and give you a matter of forgiveness to heaven. He can take your gold dust and shame and exchange it for a special position in his service. He can lift you from your prison of discouragement, doubt, or fear and bring you to a place at his table where he wants you to eat for the rest of your life.